he locks his gun sight onto the 109 and puts his finger on the trigger. I glanced at my ball and got it in the middle. Fire burst. And I got spectacular results. I got it all over the engine, the cockpit. That just lights up like a Christmas tree. The 109 spirals downwards, billowing smoke as it falls. 1979, the Cold War spreads to the Middle East. The Soviets arm countries like Syria and Egypt with their most advanced weapons. Its top seller, the MiG. Israel looks to the US for support. It must protect itself against the growing threat. By June 27, 1979, the Israelis operate 25 of the new American jets. The new weapon comes just in time. A few minutes before noon, four Syrian MiG-21s zoom towards Israeli airspace. A surprise attack. The Israelis detect the threat and alert four F-15s they have on routine patrol. Brigadier General Moshe Melnik was one of the Israeli Air Force's top fighter pilots for over 38 years. On that day in 1979, he's in the hot seat of an aircraft never before tried in combat. We got a very immediate uh, locks, um, uh, radar locks um, uh, on, the, on the MiGs. It was uh, in a distance of about uh, 30 or 25 miles. And we got the permission to, to fire. Melnick's heads-up display shows that the MiG is approaching fast. This is Moshe Melnick's actual video. Melnick launches one of his missiles. It misses. Now the MiGs are on high alert. The MiGs counterattack roaring toward Melnik at 650 miles per hour. Melnik sets his sights on the MiGs, now just seconds away. This time, he turns to a missile designed specifically for the Israeli F-15s. It's called the Python-3. This missile has a name in Hebrew called the uh, um, uh, Choach. Choach is an abbreviation of God forbid. God forbid that you will encounter this missile in the, in the air. It was in, in range and I pressed the trigger and I took the first shot. And this missile hit first the first MiG. Less than 30 seconds after Melnik first got the alert, the Israeli F-15s defeat the Syrian MiGs. Moshe Melnik becomes the first pilot to show the world the lethal qualities of this new fighter. April 1972, Udorn Air Force Base, Thailand. A team of Phantom F-4Ds take off on a MiG hunting mission. Our wing was selected to find and attack and kill MiGs. That was our wing's motto. Air Force Captain Fred Olmsted was an F-4 pilot with over 300 Vietnam combat missions. They were very fast, very nimble, very capable adversary. So we were very aware of that. We were cognizant of what the MiG-21 could do if you weren't careful. Olmsted counts on the Phantom's upgrades to help him. A better radar, improved Sidewinder heat-seeking missiles for short-range adversaries, and a lighter, more maneuverable frame. The upgrades did help. It was basically an aircraft that could dogfight and stay up with any, any MiGs the North Vietnamese had at that time. Olmsted and the other F-4s soon cross into enemy lines, daring the MiGs to come out and play. We've got all four of our radars pointing in the direction where we feel a threat might be coming. It was worth it to take a look and see if there's any trouble up there, any MiGs that want to cause trouble for our other airplanes in the area. Olmsted's intuition is right on the money. Two MiGs appear on the radar, ready to accept the Phantom's challenge. Right then and there, we knew there was going to be a dogfight. 
Somebody's gonna die, and it's not gonna be the Phantoms. The MiGs flash by, passing at just 1,500 feet. Olmstead quickly turns his Phantom to pursue and attack. As I'm turning to chase, unbeknownst to any of us, out comes another MiG from below and behind, maneuvering to try and attack me and my wingman. Olmstead and his wingman prepare to confront the first two MiGs. Another F-4 chases down the third. I pulled my nose up to get behind him. The MiG leader, he rolled on his back, went straight down right in front of me, and he was gone. He was out of the fight. The MiG knows better than to face off against the Phantom. But the second MiG isn't as quick. The number two man was right in front of me, right where I wanted him. There was no way the MiG was going to outmaneuver my Phantom. No matter what the MiG did, left or right, I countered by exactly the same maneuvers. The MiG tries to make a break for it, but he can't outmatch the F-4's speed. All of a sudden, the real high G maneuvering ended, and the MiG sort of straightened out and allowed me to get the gun sight right on him, and the missiles locked him right up. Olmstead quickly sends an AIM-7 off the rails. And it's right on target. Moments later, another F-4 shoots the second MiG down. The absolute adrenaline exhilaration after a dogfight, being over in enemy territory, shooting your adversary down and none of your flight mates are threatened and everybody comes home. It's hard to describe it to people that have never been in a dogfight. It's such a, a, an accomplished feeling that all of your training has paid off. January 1991, Operation Desert Storm. Colonel Cesar Rodriguez tries to avoid being shot down by an Iraqi MiG-29. We assumed that this guy was the biggest, baddest dude on the block, and we had to be on our number one A game to beat them. The incoming MiG is just seconds away from blowing Rodriguez out of the sky. The MiG's radar can see me, and so I go strictly into the defensive mode. Rodriguez banks left and dives down fast. If he can confuse the MiG's radar, he might have a fighting chance. MiG-29 radar is meant to look into a blue sky where there's very little clutter. So I want to force his radar to look down into the ground environment. And now the radar's got to recalculate the math to deliver a weapon. Rodriguez must escape the Iraqi MiG's deadly grasp or risk losing everything. I'm in 100% survival mode because the enemy's locked all onto my airplane. That's as vulnerable as you get in the air-to-air -air dogfight. Unless his wingman acts quickly, Rodriguez doesn't have a chance. At that point, I am in the pure defensive mode, and now I turn it over to my wingman, who is about three miles behind me. He sees the same thing that I see. He locks the lead MiG and then takes a, a shot with his AIM-7. Seconds later, Rodriguez's wingman's heat-seeking AIM-7 missile reaches the MiG. The end result was we had one MiG down. Splash one is the radio call that I made. Splash! Splash coming out westbound! And now we're trying to figure out what's next. What's next is more trouble. The E-3 AWACS alerts Rodriguez to another MiG-29 just 10 miles away. This time, Rodriguez and his wingman won't be caught off guard. We have two options. We can turn south and run away, or we can turn north and fight our way through that MiG. And the option that I selected was to fight our way through that MiG. Rodriguez and the MiG face off in an intense aerial spiral, chasing each other's tails. Suddenly, the MiG-29 flies down toward the desert floor trying to outmaneuver the F-15's radar. At that point, I suspect that the MiG felt that uh, I could either be coming in for a gunshot 
or I could be getting ready to hit him with a missile. Rodriguez watches the MiG take a hard turn back up, but it's too late to escape the momentum down. You can see his afterburners are cooking. You know, he's trying to do everything he can to bring the nose of his airplane through the horizon, but it doesn't happen. He put himself in a no-win solution, which ultimately translated into a fireball on the ground. It wasn't until after the final engagement that I started to reflect on, wow, what just happened? Because I knew I was within seconds of, of being uh, a casualty. In the Mediterranean, the tide is shifting. So the RAF goes on the offensive, led by men like Douglas Bader. Bader joins the RAF in 1928, almost a decade before war is on the horizon. Three years later, while training with the RAF acrobatic squad, Bader attempts a risky maneuver and crashes. Unfortunately, that results in a serious injury and he loses his legs. With a pair of metal prosthetic legs, he relearns how to walk and then to fly. And he pressures, pressures the Royal Air Force to get back into a cockpit and to be involved in the forthcoming fight during the Second World War. Even with 10 legs, Bader is an excellent pilot. And in 1939, the RAF takes him back. Two years later, on August 9th, 1941, with the war in full swing, Bader leads his 60-second fighter sweep over France. He's already shot down 21 German planes, and he's hungry for more. The fighter pilots, Bader in particular, felt he wanted to take the fight across the channel into northern France. At the head of three squadrons, Bader is on the hunt. Over France, he spots roughly 50 ME-109s. On this particular day, Douglas Bader sees the enemy aircraft below him, and his aggressive nature, he wants to get after them, so he dives at them. The aggressive style that makes Bader such a good pilot is a double-edged sword. Diving on the ME-109s, he overshoots and flies past his prey. Even worse, Bader has left his wingman behind, and the hunter is about to become the hunter. Without another set of eyes looking for enemy planes, Bader has made himself vulnerable. But always aggressive, he won't turn back. Then he sees enemy aircraft in front of them, and he goes into the attack against those. He takes out one and closes in on a second when he realizes he's under attack. Bader breaks sharply, and disaster strikes. Now, the fog of war it is an intense thing, Himes. You, as a fighter pilot, only can see what you can see out of your copy. So for one pilot to take in all that information under the stress, the heat, and the fatigue of battle, and to get a fully recognized air picture was a big challenge indeed. Bader claims he sideswipes another plane, while witnesses say he's shot down. Whatever the cause, the result is the same. Bader's Spitfire plummets to the ground. He barely bails out in time. Captured, Bader tries to escape by tying sheets together and lowering himself to the ground. Recaptured, he makes several more attempts, but won't stop even after the Germans threaten to take away his prosthetic legs. Finally, they confined him to Kolditz Castle, the prison for incorrigible POWs, where he spends the remainder of the war. May 18th, 1953. Captain Joe McConnell takes off in his sabre with a record-breaking 13 victories. McConnell has been flying in combat for eight months. Today is his last day in Korea. It's quiet as McConnell and his wingman, Dean Abbott, approach MiG Alley. Suddenly, the duo spot a pair of MiGs. McConnell must decide, make it home alive or risk his life for one more mission. McConnell gambles on a daring final sortie and speeds after the bogeys. 
But just as the Sabres close in for the kill, 28 MiGs ambush the eager Americans. For McConnell, it's just where he wants to be. He sees a big formation of MiGs. That's just what he wanted. He flies into that formation knowing that some of the MiG-15s will turn and slow down. That means McConnell can catch them. McConnell breaks hard and flies straight into a MiG formation. Rolling in behind one, he takes it out. Then, on the tail of a second Soviet jet, McConnell rips off another burst and tears it apart. Now, MiGs swarm from all directions. They're attacking so fast and thick, they're in danger of shooting each other down. Remaining calm, McConnell and Abbott miraculously escape the chaotic melee. McConnell was a great shot. He was cool in combat from all his experience in World War II, and he knew how to employ the right tactics to make the MiG-15s make a mistake so McConnell could line up a clean shot. The pair outrun the mix back across the Korean border. Running on fumes, they barely make it back to base. McConnell adds three more MiGs to his name. With 16 confirmed kills, he's a triple ace and the Korean War's top scorer. The nature of fighter pilot culture emphasizes competitiveness. For McConnell to end up on top as the top scoring ace is huge, not only personally, but he certainly becomes a role model for others to look up to. After three years of combat, McConnell and his co-pilots finally gain air superiority. In the summer of 1953, a ceasefire officially ends their brutal war in Korea. America's celebrity ace returns home to the California desert. He's met with fanfare and a warm embrace from his wife, Pearl. But in a devastating twist of fate, he's killed a year later in the jet that made him a star. When the Air Force offers him a chance to become a test pilot, naturally, he leaps at it. But it's a new variant of the F-86 that will end McConnell's life. McConnell not only survived some of the most harrowing combat of the Korean War, he was extremely successful at it. McConnell's death is just more evidence of how dangerous test piloting really was during this time. May 27, 1944. Hundreds of Allied bombers filled the sky, all headed for Ludwigshafen, Germany, home to a critical Nazi fuel refinery. Clarence Bud Anderson was an American P-51 fighter pilot and triple ace in World War II. Anderson and his group of P-51 Mustang fighters are there to escort the massive bomber group. If the German 109 strike, it will be up to Anderson to fend them off. We were just about to the target area just about getting into Germany when my wingman calls out, we got bogeys coming after us from five o'clock high. Anderson looks up and spots an incoming swarm of German fighters. Anderson pulls into a sharp turn, desperate to draw the 109s away from the bombers. And I look back, and go, oh my God, he's coming after us. In no time, Another 109 is on his tail. Anderson tries to shake him, but the 109 holds on tight. All of his moves were aggressive. I knew I was fighting somebody that had full in combat, because <laughs> he knew what to do. Out of options, Anderson pulls back hard on his stick, and the two fighters rocket up. As they climb, the 109 slowly inches its nose higher into firing position. Looking back there, seeing an enemy airplane on your tail is not a good feeling. Pushing their aircraft to the limit, both fighters are on the verge of stalling. We're both going like this. 
and somebody's going to lose their airspeed and stall out. And the first guy that does that is going to be in trouble. Just in time, the 109 sputters and begins to fall. Boy, it was just a great relief, and I, whew, I could follow him down sitting right there again. Anderson dives in pursuit, now hot on the tail of the 109. So I thought, oh, by God, I'm going to try to get inside of him this time. So I, I cut inside of him. I said, hot dog, I'm, I'm going to make it. I could tell I was going to get inside of him. He locks his gun sight onto the 109 and puts his finger on the trigger. I glanced at my ball and got it in the middle. Fire burst. And I got spectacular results. I got it all over the engine, the cockpit. That just lights up like a Christmas tree. The 109 spirals downwards, billowing smoke as it falls. And I can see his shadow on the ground. And pretty soon, wow, bang, he and his shadow met. Tremendous explosion. Anderson clears out, breathing a sigh of relief. He was probably the best, best pilot I ran into in the, the whole war in Europe. 